Basically, I come from the time when uh, the big development in America, I go very famous, if you are from that era, was demolished, you know, uh, affordable <coughs> housing for the underprivileged in uh, St. Louis in America. And that's one problem, sustainability. I mean, if you have built a low-cost housing and then you have to demolish in a few years, it's not sustainable. This problem really is for high rise. Because, uh, you know, studies from all over the world, and this is a, a meta study, they looked at 130, almost 130 uh, studies over 60 years. And uh, the results, if you can read, they're all bad, you know. It's less satisfactory than other housing forms, more impersonal, crime and fear of crime was greater. They can cause suicides, yeah. Uh, and for children, they're not good. The other problem also also is affordability. I mean, if you can have uh, you know unlimited sources of funds, you can spend one million dollar apartments. I think they're very good. But what about those people who cannot afford the that sort of uh, price? And you have to pay that price if you are if you want to be near the city. Okay. The other that that I have is that you have apartments which when you go to the apartment not through uh, corridors but through a sky court. A sky court is like a courtyard. A courtyard, normally you open it at the top. This one you open at the sides. And of course, to make it work, a sky court, you have to have a very high ceiling. So in this case, it's a three-story high ceiling. And this is an example of a sky court. And this is what the overall building looks like. So every house, you enter not from a corridor, you enter from a sky court. So uh, this is the plan for that building. And you can see the sky courts, the houses are around the sky courts. Well, would that be expensive? And the answer is no, because uh, I will explain to you shortly. Uh, I want to answer this question, you know, I mean, this is a sky court. Uh, these people have got their gardens. What about these people? What about those people on the upper floors? So I'm going to answer that question now. <coughs> All right, so uh, the apartment consists of two apartments, which is placed on three floors. This is the apartment you enter here, living, dining, kitchen, one apartment, you go up to the bedrooms on top, which is this one. The other apartment, you go down to the bedrooms below. Look at this one. This is the apartment. You know, one going up, one going down. All right. And this is looking from the side. Then if you stack one on top of the other, you get a three-story one. Let me show you one more time. So this is the apartment. You enter living rooms down here, bedrooms on top. Another one apartments here and the bedrooms downstairs. So the living rooms are all on this floor. Some of the bedrooms on top, some of the bedrooms are below. So three stories, two apartments. There is one module. You put one module on top of the other. You see that you've got a three-story courtyard. And everybody enters the apartments from the courtyard. So this floor, that is uh, <coughs> access from the living room downstairs at the courtyard level. This one is from the courtyard above. These apartments come from living rooms which are there, and those uh, bedrooms here come from living rooms above one floor. So what it does is that it uh, removes corridors, removes corridors from the equation, and what you have are sky courts. Sky courts are communal space. You can have them on the ground floor, outside in the, in the building, you can have it on the rooftop, but I believe that actually the best place if you want to have open space is in front of your house. Because that's like the campo, you know. You have a few, say, eight houses or 16 houses sharing a courtyard. And part of that courtyard can be your own garden, you know. So what this allows is you have a, a situation where the apartment uh, has, a, or has its own garden. Not some apartments, not a few apartments, just some high-end apartments, but all apartments. We did a study, I did it for Prima. We compared an existing project. That project is actually going on there. They were piling at the time, now it's already a few stories. And I look, looked at that same site and proposed the honeycomb alternative. Okay, Why did we do that? I mean, I'm not going to get a job because the, they're not going to demolish the existing building. But what we did is that we wanted to use the uh, information that they have on that existing project, the BQ, Builds of Qualities, and we want to compare the two alternatives and what were the what would be the difference. So let me just show you first. Uh, this is the conventional plan, all right? It's a uh, car park, apartments, uh, amenities, green areas. And this is the what my building looked like, shorter, much shorter. And it consists of uh, five blocks of apartments, much shorter. The previous one was 16 stories, this is only uh, nine stories, all right? And all the ground floor was used for car park. 
So there was no money to come up. <coughs> Alright, so this is the floor plan, typical floor plan uh, of the this is the podium level, podium plus one, that is the level on top of the podium. This is the typical courtyard level. This is the courtyard, the, the bedrooms on top of the courtyard. And previously, these are the bedrooms below the courtyard. Uh, this is the car parks. All instead of putting it on a six-story block, we put it on on the ground floor. Alright? So we did a comparison. Let me tell you the comparison. Two 15-story apartments and a separate six-story car park block with amenities and facilities. Uh, but we have nine, uh, five nine-story linked honeycomb block apartments, we call them honeycomb, uh, with facilities and entrance on the first floor of one block and car parks all on the ground floor. So one tall proposal, one short proposal, one had a uh, lot of multiple, multiple levels of car parks, the other one had only one level of car park. The size of the lot and the, uh, and the cost of the land is the same. The cross plot area, about the same, 179 uh, square meters. You know, this one, ours was 177. But you know the net sellable area, because we had no corridors and there were other tricks that we used, the net sellable area was 106 square meters compared to 88 square meters. Net sellable area is what you're selling. So this is the problem with a lot of existing uh, high-rise apartments. You, be, you maybe have 1,000 square feet of your internal area, the, the house that you build, but to service that 100 square meters, you need another 100 square meters of car parks, corridors, lobby spaces and all that. So that is, you know, it is, uh, if you think about it, it is actually very inefficient. You build 100, uh, you build 1,000 square meters, total built up area, but you can only sell 50. Sometimes it's even less than that, you know, conventional. So in our case, we have 60%. <coughs> so in this example, the conventional had 49% efficient. You see, we were 60%. The apartment uh, initially was 15 stories, now we have put it down to 8 stories. So, you know, when you have a shorter building, you are more, I think it's more humane, but it's also less construction cost. Car park floors, I hate multi level car park floors, so we just have one car park floor instead of six. Uh, number of lift stops. With this uh, arrangement, you don't need to lift on this floor and on this floor. Because this is like, you know, the upper floor of your, of the upper floor of your house. So you don't need to have a corridor to, a, to the second floor of a terrace house, you know. So the, the lift stop every three floors. So when the lift stop every three floors, it means the lifts can go faster. If, you, if, if you've been to Singapore, you know that in the 60s, 70s, they built these apartments which, where the lift stop every three or four floors and then you have to go up and down to go to your apartment. But in this case, you don't have to go, you don't have to go up and down. You just go to your apartment, your living room, you go up and down to go to your respective bedrooms. So the density, we are about the same, you know, we're actually quite lower density, but in terms of net plot ratio, that means for every acre, how many square feet of land are you selling, it's about the same. Uh, cost per gross floor area, ours was slightly cheaper. This was, remember, all this analysis was done by the same QS who did the original plan. So he's now doing the costing for the new alternative. So our cost is slightly cheaper because it's a lower building, less car parking floors, $109 per square foot instead of 119 That's not a big difference. But when you look at cost per net sellable area, see the previous one is cost per gross floor area. That means 200 square feet, this is uh, 200, uh, 2,000 square meters, this is how much it costs. But this one you say you don't count 2,000 square meters, you count, you're only able to sell 1,200 square meters. So count how much it is that you, per square meter that you're selling. And it is a big difference. It is uh, $182 per square meter instead of 242. Uh, sorry, I'm talking about per square feet now, per square feet. Actually, uh, the reduction in the cost is actually about 25%, which is a big reduction. So, um, when I looked at this, when I first saw this, I said, hey, this is very difficult to explain. How can I explain such a big, you know, remember you, that, that fellow was talking about, you know, just Mr. Fu and before that, Jay Harris saying that you can get 6%, 4% saving. Why you can get so such a big saving? So, this is my understanding, you know. This is uh, what they were talking about earlier. You know, you got land costs, uh, this is the architectural works from the builds of quantities, pre-tax profit, car park, mechanical and electrical works in the build of quantities, superstructure, infrastructure, construction, uh, consultant fees, bridging costs, sub, uh, substructure, prelims. So this is like uh, typical high rise. What is the uh, uh, you know how much is the cost? Uh, uh, how much is going uh, towards land and and architectural and so on? So we found that actually. If you want to reduce cost, you cannot just look at one factor. You cannot just look at, say, uh, superstructure, you know, if, 
let's say you do uh, lightweight construction, you save on superstructure, but you don't save anything else. Uh, it will be a small saving. If you save on uh, IBS, you save money, you must do IBS, but it's not going to save you money on land. It's not going to save you money on uh, sanitary fittings. So you must look at all the factors. And that's what I did. I looked at all the factors. And you can see what I mean here. When you uh, reduce the floor, the, uh, when your space is lower, gross floor area, that means your architectural works will reduce. Not only that, your superstructure costs also will reduce. And your uh, substructure costs also will reduce. If you uh, reduce your number of lifts because the lifts now go much faster, you only stop every three falls, you save on your M&E. If you reduce your uh, car park size, one floor instead of six floors, you reduce your car park. If you increase the number of units that you have on each floor, that, that you have in a, each project, you know, and that is where I'm going to end for this talk. If you just wait for me for this last kicker in the end. Why do we put in limits to density? Why do you say 60 units per acre? which is the national standard, not 120. It's because you are afraid of creating slums. But what if as you go higher, you're not only producing more houses, but you're producing more communal space and every house still has a garden. So the taller you go, the more green space you end up with. And it's not just green space on the ground, it's just green space in front of the house. As you go higher, you're also encouraging, you're also keeping a sort of a small town or small village atmosphere because say about 16 people share one communal courtyard, share one village green. Maybe we, they, we should be allowed to build higher densities. So as you can see, land cost is a big factor. So if you can build 200 houses instead of 100 houses, your land cost will actually half per unit basis, uh, you know, per unit basis. So, uh, you know, the savings that I was talking about was all about construction costs development, building costs. <coughs> but actually, land costs also can be affected. If you can convince uh, the authorities that yes, we can build higher densities without being inhumane. Uh, and that ends my talk. So uh, I'll pass back to uh, Kenny.